It is very nice to see everybody here today. I'm very encouraged by your presence. And for any visitors that we have here, I want to ask you to fill out a visitor's card that's in the pew in front of you. At the end of our service day, we're going to uh, offer you an opportunity to return that visitor's card to us so that we can contact you about any spiritual needs that we have and to express our gratitude for your presence in our worship today. And that is what it is. It is worship to God. For we are Christians. We wear the name of Christ. We do not wear it because we're proud of ourselves. We do not wear it because we believe we have attained perfection by our own selves. We wear the name of Christ boldly because it is His name. It is the name He's given to us. It is the only name under heaven by which all people can be saved and by which we will be saved. But what is a Christian? That might seem like a simple answer, isn't it? A Christian is simply somebody who is a follower of Christ. But it seems that as we go and talk to our friends in the community, especially those in the denominational world, the name Christian is becoming harder and harder to define in our culture. And I'll give you an example of that. In an article recently called, Is Tim Keller, who is an evangelical pastor, Is Tim Keller a Dangerous Christian? It had this to say, During a sit-down interview with Pastor Tim Keller just before Christmas, New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof suggested that Christianity can survive without the virgin birth or the resurrection. I deeply admire Jesus and His message, he said, but I'm also skeptical of themes that have been integral to Christianity. The virgin birth, the resurrection, the miracles, and so on. So the writer of this article asks, are these really essential to the Christian faith? Isn't it possible to be a Christian without embracing them? Keller replied that you can't remove Jesus' miraculous entry into the world or his miraculous return to life without destabilizing the whole of Christianity. A religion can't be whatever we desire it to be. And that's a point also that C.S. Lewis makes in one of my favorite books that he wrote called Mere Christianity. He says that if you boil Christianity down to its truly essential elements, you cannot remove the miraculous nature of Jesus and His ministry. You cannot remove the virgin birth. You cannot remove the resurrection. You cannot remove what Jesus did miraculously through His apostles in the book of Acts. Those things are all absolutely essential to Christianity. Now, I would take it a step further. I would take it a step further and say that every part of Christianity is an essential element of Christianity. And that there is no aspect of the faith that we find defined in the New Testament that can be taken away without destabilizing some other part of that faith. Now this is an important point. And I believe that the question actually matters of what is a Christian. That it does matter. That it should matter. As we talk to our friends and as our neighbors, even our family members who claim to be a Christian, it does matter how we define the term Christian. Because as the writer said in that article I just quoted, a religion can't be whatever we want it to be. Otherwise, it's not a religion. We studied in our Bible class just a few minutes ago from the book of Judges in chapter 17 and 18 the story of a man named Micah. And this individual wanted to create a religion of his own, so to speak, out of his living room. Well, out of his mother's living room, let's be honest about it. And the man had silver gods cast for him. And the man appointed a priest for himself. And he said, surely God will prosper me now because look what I've done. And really all he did was invent for himself a convenient religion that satisfied him. Satisfied his needs, his wants, and his desires. Let's consider in 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 14. 
And I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it here. In summing up the Christian faith, he has this to say in 1 Timothy 3, verse 14. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Inferred in that statement is the idea that God expects a certain kind of conduct in the household of God. That there are rules involved in conducting oneself in the household of God. There is a right way and a wrong way to conduct oneself in the household of God, which he says is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of some truth or the pillar and support of your particular variety of truth or the pillar and support of a truth that you espouse. No, the church is the pillar and support of the truth. And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. By common confession, what does he mean by that in verse 16? That these are truths that we all hold. And that there is no truth in the gospel that you're allowed to dismiss, to write off, or to remove altogether from the whole. By common confession means that every Christian believes these things. They are not up for debate. So by common confession, he says in verse 16, he who was revealed in the flesh, that is, that Jesus actually lived. You must actually believe that there was a man named Jesus of Nazareth who came to planet Earth and lived a physical existence in a real time, in a real place. You must believe in the historicity of Jesus was vindicated in the Spirit, that God proved all things through Him, that God illustrated all things through Him, that everything Jesus said was God's truth, beheld by angels, that He was seen by angelic beings, that they witnessed His suffering, that they comforted Him in the garden before His crucifixion, proclaimed among the nations, that this message actually has validity, not just for our own culture, but for all cultures for all time. Believed on in the world and taken up in glory. You must believe that Jesus ascended to glory to be with His Father. And there's not a thing in this statement that you can take away without destabilizing what Christianity is supposed to be. You see a similar statement back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The whole of chapter 15, of course, speaks to the resurrection itself, but this is what the apostle had to say by way of introduction to that idea. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Great idea there. Very practical idea as well. The gospel that we believe in is the gospel that we stand in. And it is also the gospel that saves us if we hold fast to it. If we maintain it. If we keep it. If we believe it. He says in verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance. Now I think there's something inferred in that. That there are things in the gospel that are of first importance. But that doesn't mean the other things in the gospel are unnecessary. Let's make that point again. Let's remember that because I think that's a tough one that we have to defend out there in the religious world. There are things in the gospel that are of first importance, but that doesn't make everything else unnecessary. The resurrection of Jesus is of first importance. And he brings that out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But that doesn't mean baptism is unnecessary for salvation. In fact, baptism and resurrection, as we'll see here in a few minutes on another slide, are interconnected with each other. Yes, there are things that are of first importance, but that doesn't mean all the rest of the gospel is optional or that we're allowed to debate it and discuss it and edit it and revise it to our tastes. For illustration, I'll put this up here. I believe that everything up here on this screen is of absolute importance to the gospel. That that there's nothing on this screen that you can take away and still have the good news of salvation. But when you talk to the broader community of those who claim to be Christians, 
There are a number of these things that would be very convenient to get rid of. Let's just get rid of baptism first of all because there's so much debate and so much division over it. Do we sprinkle? Do we pour a cup of water over somebody's head? Do we fully immerse them? Do we immerse them as little children or babies or as adults? What is the role of faith in baptism? Is it necessary? Is it just an option? Let's just get rid of baptism altogether, shall we? And make things more convenient. But what is the church? Let's get rid of that also. Because our very definition of the church is certainly up for debate in the religious world, isn't it? What is the role of the church? What is the purpose of the church? Is it an organization? Is it an institution? Or is it just a body of saved people? But we want to get rid of Jesus' teaching on marriage too because in a culture like ours, as pluralistic as it is, with so much divorce, with gay marriage being an issue that it is, with people living together as couples before they're married, Matthew chapter 19 proves to be a very inconvenient thing to try to proclaim in this world. But you might as well get rid of heaven and hell also because Jesus said a lot of things about heaven and hell. In fact, he said more about hell than he ever said about heaven. And we certainly wouldn't want to hurt people's feelings by proclaiming the truth of eternal hell. The Sermon on the Mount, which sounds really nice at first because the Beatitudes are kind of flowery and nice sounding to people in the world, really is an incredibly difficult sermon to listen to. It's shocking, actually. Revolutionary in its nature. We certainly wouldn't want people to have their feelings hurt by statements made in the Sermon on the Mount, such as that the way of God is narrow and few are those who find it. But the miracles of Jesus... Were they just parlor tricks or just nice stories? Do we have to believe that Jesus actually turned water into actual wine? Do we actually have to believe that Jesus could give people the ability to see? Or did he merely use those things as parables and illustrations? Is Jesus nothing more than Santa Claus wiggling his nose and fitting down your chimney? Well, let's get rid of the miracles also. But the virgin birth, the first miracle of all in Jesus' life, we don't want to debate about that either. That's a tough one to believe too. Most people don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Oh, and the apostles too. <laughs> Let's just get rid of Peter, James, and John, and Paul while we're at it too because Jesus gave them permission to say some awfully difficult things to believe and accept. But if we're going to get rid of that as well, we should get rid of Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. We want our Jesus to be a convenient Jesus, a nice Jesus, the Gandhi Jesus or the Mother Teresa Jesus who's always sweet and kind, not one who turns tables over because he is so highly offended by the abuse of those in the household of God. Well, what are we really left with then? Resurrection? I don't know if we have to believe in the resurrection, do we? Say some in our culture. Is the resurrection really integral, absolutely necessary to the Christian faith? But if you get rid of that, I guess you just have to ask yourself, do you really believe that Jesus was anything? That Jesus was even real? Or is Jesus like Johnny Appleseed or Paul Bunyan? A myth, a tale, a legend, a parable and certainly not the living Son of God. And by the time you've whittled Christianity down, by the time you've gotten rid of everything about Christianity that is up for debate, you're not left with anything. You're not left with anything. So what is a Christian? If a Christian doesn't have to believe any of these things, what is a Christian? If we've just boiled it down to the absolute lowest common denominator, which I suppose the lowest common denominator is, you can be a Christian if you just call yourself a Christian. Right? Well, what I'd like to do is present to you a few of the things that the Bible says 
make you a Christian. The Bible's own definition of Christian. And I fear that we're, for the sake of time, we're going to have to go through these fairly quickly. Please write down the things on the screen if you'd like to study them further or watch the lesson later on on our website. If there's details in there that you'd like to dig into later, please ask me because this is the most essential question that we can ask about our Christianity. What does it mean to be a Christian? I believe the Bible puts it this way. You are a Christian if you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I get that definition from Matthew chapter 16, which was read earlier in our worship service. When Jesus confronts his disciples, Peter in particular, and says, who do the people say that I am? And they throw out all kinds of options that you're one of the prophets or you're this man or you're that man or you're just a good man. And maybe that's a little bit of what we saw in that article at the beginning of the lesson, right? I admire Jesus. I like Jesus. I like some of the things he said. I admire him the way I admire Martin Luther King Jr. I admire him the way I admire Gandhi. I admire him the way I admire my favorite teacher from school. But the Apostle Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that confession, Jesus' church will be built. It is God who showed Peter that truth. Not Peter's own wisdom, not Peter's own opinion, not what other people told him to think about Jesus. But by God's divine truth, it was revealed to the Apostle Peter that Jesus is not just Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the promised Messiah, and the Savior of all who would come to him on God's terms. And that is the only logical conclusion that Peter could possibly come to. Given the witness that he saw, the witness as explained in John chapter 5, the witness of John the Baptist, the witness of the works themselves, the witness of the Scriptures, the witness of the Heavenly Father, who could come to a conclusion that is not the Christ? Who could possibly come to a conclusion that is different than that? Jesus himself says that belief in him is connected to eternal life. Go to John chapter 11 and notice in Jesus' own words in verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you? Do you? Do you believe this? Now, I think the practical application is this. It has to be a public belief, like Matthew chapter 10 says, that if you confess belief in me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. It must be a public belief that includes both the facts of his ministry, that he actually lived and actually did everything that the Gospels claim he did, and also the content of his preaching. You must believe what he did. You must believe what he said. You must believe that he is actually everything that he claimed to be. In John chapter 20, the apostle sums it up very well as he says in verses 30 and 31, summing up the story of Jesus as presented in his gospel. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So first and foremost, to be a Christian, you must believe in Jesus. But I think the Bible also says that you're a Christian if you have accepted Jesus' message in its entirety, not just the parts that you like or the parts that you find convenient. Go to John chapter 6. And as Jesus has spent practically the entire chapter of John 6 illustrating that He alone holds the bread of life, that He is in fact the bread of life, and the one who partakes of the bread of life has life in Himself, it says here in verse 41, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. 
And they were saying in verse 32, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said, Don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets in verse 45. They shall all be taught of God. That's Jeremiah chapter 31. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Now notice verse 47 here. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. It is his words, it is his sacrifice, and it is the way that we partake of those things that we share in the life that he offers. Now, are you allowed to just take from that what you want? Certainly in the immediate context, his disciples were listening to him talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they said, that's a really difficult statement. That's hard to accept. And as a result of it, many of them, most of them, quit following him from that day forward. In response to that, Peter says this near the end of the chapter. Lord, in verse 68, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. How can we possibly go anywhere else? How can we possibly not accept every part of what you've said? You're the words of life. You have everything. You have everything. Now Jesus says this in John chapter 8 in one of the truly great statements of the Bible. He says in verse 31, If you abide in My Word, you are truly disciples of Mine. Seize upon that statement for a moment. If you abide in My Word, you are truly disciples of Mine. That's the question we're asking today, isn't it? That's the question. What makes you a Christian? Well, Jesus just answered it for us. If you abide in His Word... You are a disciple of Christ. Now we infer from that then that if you don't abide in His Word, you're not a disciple. So are you allowed to keep one foot out the door? Well, I'll believe all of this, but I don't think I can get rid of that worldly idea. Are you, are you allowed to keep one foot out the door? Are you allowed to keep your ear to the ways of the world? To ride the fence? To keep your options open. My friends, I'm going to put it bluntly. When you become a Christian, you have agreed with God to burn all other bridges. You have agreed with God to burn all other bridges. It's not that God might exist or that Jesus is maybe the Christ or that I want to believe just in case. No, when you become a Christian, you are agreeing with God to burn all other bridges. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but through Me. No one comes to the Father but through Me. Now the practical side of this point is that nobody can do this for you. I can't read the Bible for you. I can't abide in the Word of God for you. Jesus said, if you abide in My words, you're My disciples. Not if somebody does it for you. Not if it's outsourced to somebody else. Not if you trust somebody who you think is smarter than you or wiser than you or who has the time to do it for you. I can't do this for you. And when you study the Word and abide in the Word and know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Sorry, you can't farm that out to anybody else. As convenient as that would be, as much as you want to, you can't farm that out to anybody else. 
But the Bible also has this to say. You are a Christian if you have responded to the gospel as Jesus defined it. It's not just a matter of believing in what Jesus says. It is also a matter of acting upon the belief. You must also act in the truth in the way that he prescribed it as well. There's a sobering story in John chapter 12 of some people who did believe. They did believe. But they had an obstacle that they couldn't overcome. It says in John chapter 12 and verse 42, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him. That's that Matthew chapter 10, you must confess me before men, right? But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Belief alone will not save you. Belief alone is not enough. You must believe and act upon that belief as well. We are commanded by Jesus in the gospel to believe in him and be baptized in Mark 16, verse 16. And we are saved when we believe in him and are baptized. He describes baptism in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 28 as the very means by which we become disciples. So I suppose you could say you're a Christian if... You've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, just exactly as Jesus described. And his apostles were taught the exact same thing, that when they went out and presented the gospel to the world, they also presented baptism as essential to salvation. In every example in the book of Acts, from the very beginning in Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. To Acts chapter 8 where they believed Philip preaching the word and they were baptized. To the story of the Ethiopian eunuch who believed that Jesus was the Son of God and went down into the water along with Philip the evangelist and was baptized and went on his way rejoicing. Into chapter 10 and verse 48 where Cornelius was given the gift of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues just as the apostles were. And on the basis of that, the Apostle Peter concluded, who could resist that? Who could say no to that? Who could deny them the opportunity to have their sins washed away when God has so approvingly put the stamp upon them that they should hear the gospel, that they should believe in it, and that they should be allowed to be baptized as well and to become a part of the kingdom of God just like anybody else? In all of these examples, in Philippi, in Corinth, in Ephesus, everywhere the apostles went, they taught that you must believe in Jesus and respond to that belief by being baptized for the remission of your sins. Put another way, baptism does a great many things. And without baptism, we have missed out on the content of the gospel. My friends, baptism puts us into Christ and to His death according to Romans chapter 6. It is the very means by which we are buried with Him. And when we're buried with Him, when we die to our old life, we're raised up with Him in newness of life just as He was raised from His grave to newness of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 says that baptism puts us into the body of Christ. Baptism saves us, according to 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Baptism clothes us with Christ in Galatians chapter 3. Baptism causes the remission of our sins, the wiping away of all of our misdeeds. And it washes us in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. As we already pointed out, baptism makes us disciples of Christ. It is through baptism and not faith alone that we're buried with Him, Romans 6 and verse 4, and then raised up with Him in Colossians 2 and verse 12. Colossians 2, 12, by the way, one of the great, great verses on salvation that explains it so clearly that anybody who does not get it probably won't get anything. It is not a superstitious or magical ritual, but it is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. So my question, I suppose, on the subject of what makes you a Christian, if you have not been put into Christ and if you've not died to your old life, if you are not saved and you're not clothed with Christ, 
If your sins have not been remitted or washed away, if you've not been made a disciple, if you've not been buried with Him and then raised up with Him, if you have not made an appeal to God for a clean conscience, how can you say you're a Christian? If this is what baptism does, then what you're saying, if baptism is not necessary, then none of these things are necessary for your salvation either. That you can be a Christian without any of the things on the screen right now. So you're a Christian if you're baptized. And you're baptized for the right reasons. And you're baptized in the way that God has prescribed it in the New Testament. Let's bring our lesson to a close on this last point. You are a Christian if personal spiritual growth and faithfulness are a priority to you. If you want to grow and you seek opportunities to grow, I think that's what defines us as Christians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Clearly, clearly, God did the greater part in saving us, He's paved the way for our salvation. But as it says in this passage in Colossians chapter 1, all of the gifts of God are yours if you stand firm. You must stand firm in faithfulness. Take the faithfulness away and what have you done but get wet. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, he says of our walk with Jesus Christ, he says, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And he goes on to describe in the rest of Colossians chapter 3 what that looks like. When you're seeking the things above, it means that you're putting away anger and malice and unrighteousness. If you're seeking the things above, it means you're replacing those bad things with all of the good things and you're allowing the word of Christ to richly dwell within you. And whatever you do in word or deed, you do all in the name of Christ. That's what it looks like to seek God, to seek faithfulness in Him. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, the reader is told to long for the milk of the word like a newborn baby. If you're not longing for the milk of the word, if you're not longing to understand it deeper, to study it more, to apply it more, you are malnourished spiritually and you are not growing. And like we read in Hebrews chapter 5, going on into chapter 6 as well, by now you ought to be teachers of the Word, but you're so stunted, you failed to grow, you failed to learn, and you have need now to go back to the elementary things. You should be in college by now, but you forgot what a square and a circle looked like. And you forgot what it takes to make green out of yellow and blue. Spiritually, my friends, if you're not growing, you're dying. If you're not learning, you're losing. Because Christianity is not like riding a bike. You can't just put it down for a few years and then pick it up expecting to just go right where you were before. We have to grow. And that, my friends as much as anything else, defines what it means to be a Christian. And to keep being a Christian. Not just when you've been excited after getting baptized. Not for those first few months after tasting salvation. But 10 years down the road and 20 years down the road and when you have reached the twilight of your life be even stronger then than you are now. Wiser then than you are now. More deeply capable of love and compassion and forgiveness than you do now. So what does it mean to be a Christian? It means exactly what the Bible says. And you can't define it any other way. You can't be a Christian on your terms or anybody else's. Be a Christian in spirit. And in truth, be a Christian as Christ has said it. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. You really ought to be. Consider carefully what you must do now with the opportunity 
I invite you that if you have any spiritual needs at all, to let those needs be known while together we stand and sing.